Cobra Kai's Martin Cove. Come on out. Oddly enough, when I do this job, I always ask the same question to everyone. Is there anything you do want to talk about and anything you don't want to talk about? And he just told me he's going to give away all the spoilers for the next season. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, right? Oh. <laughs> well, I would ask you about upcoming projects, but it seems like you've got that you've got that one big one. You want to talk about some other things coming? Well, uh, is this good? Everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm doing Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of bizarre, you know, I actually, I mean, I, I, they asked me to do it, and, and I said I would, and I was doing it because I like some of the nostalgia of when I used to rock and roll in the 60s, and, and then learning a little bit of the tango and flamenco, some of the things that I personally cheat on, you know, and just... <laughs> Just fake, but I'd love to learn the tango. And I'd love to learn, you know, flamenco and all. So they got me doing "Moment of Truth," the song, the first coming up on the 20th of September when I go on the show, and I'm doing um, doing it to flamenco you know, style dancing. So it's going to be really interesting, and uh, the people are very nice. They're a little compulsive. They call ten times a day about makeup and hair and reschedules and schedules and rehearsals and all that. Um, but it should be very interesting, you know. It should be a very interesting publicity deal. And yet, I never thought it would be so much work because you really have to, it conditions you for, you know, for the next season for Cobra Kai. So you don't mind that, you know. And the dancing is brilliant. Just who you're dancing with. So I pride myself in always asking a couple of questions, and one specifically that I know the audience probably isn't going to ask, and I could not make my mind up of which way I want to go. So I'm going to kind of put it in a two-parter, and then I'm turning it completely over to you. I mean, you worked with the, the late, great Ben Gazzara and Capone. I think that's amazing as a film geek, but you also worked on Death Race 2000, which, I mean, you got a story about either one of those that you'd like to share? And Death Race 2000 is a Corman picture, David Carradine from the, uh, what's it, about 74? It was a Corman picture. 74 right. was, was Capone. 74 was, a, it was actually one of the first movies I had done. It's a movie about Al Capone starring uh, an actor named Ben Gazzara. And Susan Blakely, who was my good, good friend, she was in it too. And I played Pete Gusenberg. Now, Pete Gusenberg is a character in the 30s who died in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre that you've seen in different movies. You know, it, it, it was the Capone gang against the O'Banion gang, and, and Capone just had his men in an alleyway um, shoot with machine guns the, the, um, the gunmen of the O'Banion gang. And this happened in 32, 31. And it's a famous deal called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So what was interesting, a funny story about that was, I was a young actor and, and all the stuntmen, I was the only actor putting my hands against the wall like so. All the rest was six stuntmen, and there were seven men killed. And um, they come into the into this alleyway and they dress like cops, and then they just mow everybody down. So all the stuntmen fell like dominoes, like this, because they, they weren't interested in being seen. I, of course, had just come to Hollywood that year, <laughs> and there was a chair there, and I grabbed the chair, and I flip over the chair, and I do this Shakespearean death, you know, <laughs> like swords, like Julius Caesar getting nailed by all the senators, and it was incredible, and uh, I truly remember that, because in those early days when I did White Line Fever and a lot of other movies, you, want, you didn't have a lot of dialogue because you were a young actor. So you got, if you had a physical part, you try to make the best of it. So instead of just getting hit, like you do now and falling down, like the smart stuntmen did in those days, you would do these weird, uh, you know, white line fever, I see myself getting, 
I lofted myself up in the air, and I say to myself, as I land, I say, that's why my shoulder hurts. <laughs> that's why my back is out. That's why the vertebrae is on an S. You know, because as a young actor, you're always trying to impress somebody so you, you really seem into the moment versus just what you do now. Someone hits me in a movie, and you just go down. You know, you don't try to do any you know, pirouettes or anything. And so that, that was the, you know, wonderful Capone story. I mean, I, 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 there were so many because it was, you know, a picture about all the things we grew up with in gangster land, you know, and um, loved working with Ben Gazzara. He was truly, you know, active studio and it was great to talk to him. And um, the movie right before that was another gangster movie called The Four Deuces, where Jack Palance starred. And I got to go out with Jack and, and really just he and I would share a lot of moments. I'm all in the business one year. And he shared a lot of his experiences with me, and it was great. It was really terrific. And Death Race 2000 was with Sly again, who we both knew each other, you know, years ago, before Capone or uh, Death Race 2000. And we were sitting in the trailer one day, this is February of 1975, I remember, right after, three months after we did Capone together. And I said, Sly, well, what is that red script you have? He says, oh, you know, I'm trying to get this boxing movie made. It's just been a pain in the ass. And of course there it was. It was within a year he got it made, and it was 1.8 million. And John Avelson, the same director who directed me in all three Karate Kid movies, was that director. And uh, there were, I remember I was doing a series called Code R, and I couldn't go to the first screening of Rocky. And he called me once, called me twice, and we were friends then. And then he got tired of calling me, and I got tired of saying, God, I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm doing this series, and I can't get to a screening. And then I didn't hear from him for seven, eight years until the offer came from First Blood Part Two, And then, you know, we stayed friends since. But uh, I always love that story of, that's just some boxing movie I'm trying to get made. Yeah. It was just some boxing movie he was trying to get made. You know? Yeah. You know? All right, I'm going to shut up now. Who has the first question? Who wants to go first? Right here. You go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, take your mask off. I think you know, I can hear you better. A little louder. Out of all your Cobra Kai, out of all the Cobra Kai characters in the show, who is your favorite besides your character? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Billy and I go back so far. The scenes between Billy Zabka and you know, Johnny Lawrence and myself have such history because we would go back to the movies when he was probably the closest thing to a son that John Kreese had, despite you know him being angry at him and all Karate Kid too. But I would say outside of, of Johnny, um, I really enjoy Hawk and Tori a lot, you know, because they've got guts, and uh, you know, Hawk is allergic, and you know, and Tori, it's really great because in season four there's some great vulnerable moments between Tori and I, and she's come up like, you know, I think that was established when I visit her and try to recruit her, she comes up the same way I did, you know, having parents who were difficult and, and abused and. It's great to see the maturation of those characters because Tori was not a martial artist. And the first thing I said, I remember watching her first fight scene with Miguel and, and I said, why did they cast this girl? She can't do anything. And slowly she's matured into a really good martial artist with nunchucks and all these wonderful things that she's doing. So I think the two of them, because I can really be a father figure to Tori and we have great moments in season four, which you'll see in September. And, you know, and Hawk is really what John Kreese was like, you know, when he was young. A really independent. Yeah, I think Hawk likes blood more than John does. <laughs> his age, but I think those are my favorite characters. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, right there, and then the lady next to you. You mentioned Stallone a minute ago. Uh, is he approachable on set? How does it like to work with him? Uh, do you just give a little insight into Stallone? As far as well, he's really very, very
very talented fellow. He writes, you know, he writes really well. Wr writes a lot of comedy. It's comedy in The Expendables. There's the occasional comedy in Rocky. And, you know, um, when we did Rambo, it was business for six days a week, and then we'd party on a Saturday. We'd go out and uh, have fun. But he, you know, only six days a week, and he would work out, you know, three, four times a day. And uh, we, had a, we had a lot of fun, you know, because we had an old German clockmaker who was our personal manager back in the early 70s. And he would get us jobs. We'd talk about it all the time. He would get Sly a job as an usher in a movie theater. And he would get me a job as a Santa Claus in a department store. <laughs> and it was really funny because I could never last it. I think I was, I remember it was $180 a week. And uh, I lasted three days because the kids were coughing on me and sneezing on me. <laughs> it was terrible. 180 that's not bad at that time. Well, I guess so. I don't know. I never worked for 180. Uh, 180. I don't know. Eight hours a day. So oh, okay. With kids sneezing on you, coughing. I don't know if it's such a good job. <laughs> All right. Now, yes, ma'am, you go right ahead. No minutes. Just stand up and yell it out. Why would he so mean? Maybe take your take your mask off. I can hear you better. What? Why was I so mean? <laughs> uh, I want to tell everybody. Everybody, someone says you're a great villain and all that over the years. I always think of John Kreese as misunderstood. <laughs> I never think of John Kreese as a bad guy. I really don't. Because bad guys are just like, um, you know, they just do it to be evil as we've seen in so many of the Marvel comic book films, but, or for the conquest of the world or whatever. But John Kreese really, as you see the flashbacks, there's a reason why. And the more flashbacks you see, which you'll see in season four, the more vulnerable the character becomes. And I've always enjoyed playing vulnerability on this, with this character. You know, I mean, I'm not like John Kreese. I mean, I cry at the supermarket over it. You know, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but the thing is, is that I enjoy playing the vulnerable moments. When I was had that great time with Billy in the men's shelter, and he agrees to take me on as a, an assistant, you know, sensei. And it was, you know, I told him the whole history of what was happening with me. And then there were the flashbacks that, that assist in that quality of vulnerability. And he's just, he's not all that hard in essence, for the sake of being tough. He really uh, had a background of, you know, abused by his captain. And through all those flashbacks in season three, which there were a lot more in season four, you get to see this guy is the way he is, very moral, very tough, very moral. And uh, there are a lot of facets of his character that I believe should go on in America now, you know, about, you know, marshmallow, you know, marshmallow um, butterflies. And, and uh, it was really interesting that some of the viewpoints I did have as Mark Cove, but I'm more sensitive than John Kreese, and yet there's a lot of, a lot of important morals that he has that I believe should be instilled in a lot of kids today. Well, Vincent Price famously said there's, he didn't play villains, he like characters besieged by their fate. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't play it as a villain. You can look at the character as a villain. There's no way to do that as an actor. I did a movie called Price for Freedom. And Price for Freedom was a story of, it was like Schindler's List, and it was from a book. And a dentist wrote it. And he would spend a lot of money getting people out of Iran during the, uh, the crisis when the Ayatollah was taking over. And I remember I had to play the, sec the sidekick, basically Ayatollah Kunkali, Kunkali, who was worse than me. I mean, he would sit in court and preside over Americans. And if you wore red, white, and blue, you sided with the West, and he would destroy your family and take your possessions and all. And I, when I got that part, I said to myself, 
how am I going to do this? How am I going to play this beast, you know, who is anti-American, anti-everything West, you know? And the only way that I did it psychologically for myself was to think that I was doing a service to my people, that I was doing a service, I was being a hero to my people, you know, at that point in time, the Muslims. <coughs> and I was performing a service keeping the American Westerners out of Iran, and anybody who was sympathetic had to go. And uh, it was the only way as an actor to convince yourself of that you were a hero to your people. Because I don't think any actor that plays a dark character, if he doesn't have fun with it, if he doesn't really have it, you know, I think Klaus Maria Brandauer, if any of you remember, he was a bad guy in one of the Bond movies. And he was so terrific, so terrific. And, you know, charm just oozed out of him, you know. And then you, you had even Hannibal Lecter, you know, Anthony Hopkins, he plays it with such joie de vie, you know. He plays it with a joy for life. And that's the kind of villain you like. You know, you don't like a teeth gritting kind of tough guy that might kill you. It's not really interesting to watch as an audience member. See, good question. Let me run into it. Yes, sir, and then we'll move over here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, so one thing I love about Cobra Kai is it's maintained the spirit of Mr. Miyagi to where he's almost like a character in the show. Do you have any stories or anything great to tell about Pat Morita and what he was like working with him? Well, he was, he was very instrumental in my third reading for the character, and he was there they were, off, were on the set shooting. And John Evelson, the director, had the camera over his shoulder. Um, and the assistant, who, there was the scene where uh, I would tell him, if you, if you don't show up, it's open season on him and you. And we did that. And uh, I had to react right to him next to camera. And he was so giving, and he was so good. And you know, he just said, go for it. And so I really did the scene like I did it in, in the movie. And he was just really a gracious fellow. And gave, he gave us, uh, each Christmas, he gave us great presents. He gave us a loose leaf of lots of photographs taken during the movie. And uh, we would have a drink once or twice a year during the odd years when we weren't shooting. And he was just a very, just a lovely man, very funny guy, very funny. I didn't have a lot of scenes with him other than when he comes to my dojo. But we did a lot of playing because he had a great sense of humor. He was dark and funny. And uh, I often, you know, the writer, uh, Robert Kamen, who is a terrific writer. And to me, it's always interesting. What constitutes a great writer or a great movie is if you remember the lines years later. So we all remember Wax Off, Wax On, you know, Sweep the Leg, No Mercy. We all remember those. Force Be With You from Gone with the Wind, frankly, Scarlet. And I often had this argument with the, with the writer. He, he said the movie was very successful because of the chemistry between Ralph and Pat. I always thought the movie was so memorable because of the writing. Because we remembered the writing 35 years later I still go into a building and the security guy says, sweep the leg. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever just lost it one day? Just one too, one too many sweep the legs? <laughs> it's hard to lose it because the sweep the leg is like, you know, every day it comes into my life. So it's really, you know, you, you see a promo for, I mean, even from promo for Dancing with the Stars, they had me clearing their blood off his nose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and that was last week. You know? and, then, and then people, they, they, you know, they always want Sweet the Lego No Mercy written on a photo. And it's kind of, you know, interesting because No Mercy came out, was popular years ago in the war movies, and, you know, you would hear No Mercy. But because it's taken in the connotation now, because Sweet the Leg, you know, Bobby says, I can beat him, Sensei. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to beat you know, so, and then Billy exercises, you know, sweeping the leg. It just comes, it, 
it's everybody around who says it has a different take on it. So it's really fun. Some have a humorous take, some are very serious. They say sweet thing. They come up to me and they say sweet thing. <laughs> but it just means so much and wax on and wax I remember wax on and wax off gets a lot of play too and, and Ralph and I are doing a show we're doing, I think it's Atlanta and we're on a parade, just Ralph and I this time sitting on the back of a, of a convertible city and as we're going down there's 60,000 people screaming and they're all screaming no mercy, sweep the leg no mercy is for the weak <coughs> and then Ralph turns and he says you know, I'm the star of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm the star of this movie, and no one ever screams, well, wax on, wax off. <laughs> and I thought that was hysterical. Because you know? they don't. People don't scream, wax on. You know? So it just kind of, I think, when you coin those words, it shows a true appreciation. For uh, All right. So that is it. So the news is, is that basically since uh, somebody pulled the fire alarm, well, honestly, um, it's uh, been canceled, the rest of the panel for Cobra Kai. So just wanted to let you guys know that. So we'll see about catching up with some other stuff on the very last day. So here we go. Well, hey everyone. This wraps up this year's Lexington Con. Lexington Con will be back in March, and I will be back here again in March because it's going to be a different experience that, that you want to see out there. Somebody that's never been to a Comic Con, somebody's Comic that. Comic Con! Comic Con! Those of you that have never been to a Comic Con, basically, well. This is the experience. This is the fun of it. This is the life. This is what you do at a Comic Con. You have fun. You get to cosplay. You get to see celebrities. You get to buy stuff. It's like going to the fair. You know, you get to buy stuff there. When going in to the exhibition halls, you get to buy different um, stuff of your favorite superheroes. Those of you like Spider Man, Superman, uh, Hulk. Uh, Marvel, DC, the list goes on and on and on. Well, those of you that like uh, any show in general, Doctor Who, Quan Leap, uh, those of you that are into the 80s TV shows, 70s TV shows, Star Trek, the list goes on and on and on. Well, those of you that love going to Comic Cons or have never been to a Comic Con, this is what Comic-Con is all about. So, my name is Chris. I will be back here again in March of 2022. And this has been a top level media. And I will see you all on the very next one. And bye for now.